Hello, and welcome to our Week 3 Supplemental Lecture on Joseph Schumpeter's Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. Uh, this is a set of excerpts from a very long book, and because they're taken from the middle of the book, uh, they can be more difficult to read than they might otherwise be. So I'll spend a little bit of time at the beginning here talking about what the book as a whole is trying to do, and then we'll get to this concept, which is one of the concepts that Schumpeter is best known for, uh, which is the notion of capitalism as creative destruction, and it's a concept that makes really interesting connections to both Foucault and Weber. This is a good reading to pair with the Foucault from this week. So Schumpeter is an opponent of socialism, but he's writing in a period where there is a general intellectual presumption that capitalism is on the way out, that it can maybe be bolstered a bit by state intervention in the West, but that socialism is going to phase in, most likely as a replacement. Schumpeter is trying to write the book to appeal to socialists in an effort to win them over to the notion that capitalism might still be viable in spite of these historical tendencies. He's also an extremely careful reader of Marx, and he's a fairly accurate reader of Marx, which is actually somewhat unusual even if someone thinks they're a Marxist. Uh, so he, a lot of the ideas that he's known for, including this concept of creative destruction, he's actually pulling out of Marx's capital, uh, but because it's not the normal way you read Marx, it tends to be regarded as Schumpeter's original contribution, uh, and certainly the way he wields it and uses it to criticize the economic theory of his own day is a properly original con uh, contribution. So he's writing in the early 40s, he's writing after the Great Depression, he's writing after the rise of the Soviet bloc and the development of planned economies, and the experience of wartime planned economies, uh, even in the parts of the world that are trying to maintain uh, a capitalist economic system, and the development of sort of Keynesian forms of intervention, and we'll talk more about Keynes and what Keynesianism means when we get into the economic section of the course. Uh, it's a word that you'll probably hear thrown around in the newspapers quite a lot, particularly in the wake of the recent economic crisis, as people started wondering whether maybe we had abandoned too much of the Keynesian system and that that might have helped let the crisis happen. We'll talk about that again later in the term. So the question that Schumpeter is facing is you have the development of modern industrial economies, and these economies look very, very different from capitalism in its 19th century form. They're not primarily based in individual proprietorships. Uh, you have large-scale production that is oriented to mass consumption, and it looks very crisis-ridden. It looks like there's a huge tendency to overproduce and create crises because people are not able to consume all the stuff that's been produced, they're not able to purchase it. And the reason for the concern that capitalism might not be sustainable in this particular historical period is that the development of large-scale industry has sort of undermined the technical bases that might have made a competitive capitalist form viable. Okay, so Schumpeter's in an environment where people are wrestling with the question and will revisit this question again when we get into week nine of the course, whether the only path forward lies in some sort of possibly less oppressive Soviet-style response, or whether there's some way to revive capitalism. I've included a very interesting prologue um, that makes some great observations on method. It's something that, if it weren't so specific to the question of capitalism, could very well have gone into the what is theory handout at the beginning of the term. He starts, can capitalism survive? No, I do not think it can. But this opinion of mine, like that of every other economist who has pronounced upon the subject, is in itself completely uninteresting. Okay? The prediction, which is often what people think they're after with a social science theory, he's saying is just, it's unimportant. What counts in any attempt at social prognosis is not the yes or no that sums up the facts and arguments that lead up to it, but those facts and arguments themselves. They contain all that is scientific in the final result. You all should keep this in mind for your course papers. It's the facts and the arguments that we're interested in as well. Everything else he says is not science, but prophecy. 
Analysis, whether economic or other, never yields more than a statement about the tendencies present in an observable pattern. And these never tell us what will happen to the pattern, but only what would happen if they continued to act as they have been acting in the time interval co covered by our observation, and if no other factors intruded. Inevitability or necessity can never mean more than this. And this is very important because he's writing at a period where people are talking about inevitable social trends. Those trends look very linear. And he's just pointing out what's a quite reasonable position to point out, which is these are trends in human societies. They're caused by human behavior. And inevitability in that kind of context can only mean that we continue to behave in the same way, that nothing from the outside that we didn't expect intrudes and causes our behavior to change, or that we don't decide to change our behavior. So although he starts with the, can capitalism survive? No, I don't think it can. He's actually hoping that it can survive. That's his advocacy position, so to speak, if it's not his analytical position. And there's a plea in this for people to realize that this is a social situation and that they can, in fact, behave differently. And in behaving differently, they can put other options on the table. And then he says, Social life is incredibly complicated. There are far more variables than there might be in a simple experimental system. So even just laying out what's happening can be extremely complex. But that complexity doesn't mean it's impossible. He thinks that there are things that we can say and do. And then he outlines what his basic argument's going to be. Mm -hmm. He's arguing that in contrast to a particular view, a particular Marxist theory of capitalism, it's not that capitalism is going to fail, it's that it's going to succeed and the nature of its success will end up undermining it. Okay? Its very success, he says, undermines the social institutions which protect it and, quote, inevitably causes conditions in which it will not be able to live and which strongly point to socialism as the heir apparent. Okay, so this is not an argument about overwhelming economic or social forces. This is an argument about how people's attitudes and decisions and behaviors tend to be affected by the success of capitalist institutions and therefore an argument about what people seem like they're going to be likely to do, what kinds of decisions they seem like they're going to be likely to make. And he thinks that's going to lead to, to capitalism's fading away in favor of socialism. And then again, very interesting observations on method here. He says, his prognosis is similar to that of the socialists, but it's not an argument in favor of socialism. This is a descriptive analysis. It's not a moral favoring of what he's saying is going to happen. And this is interesting as well, because there are forms of analysis in his time and in ours that think that you get moral force from just what's going to happen anyway that there's something about the trends in history that shows us what's correct or what's right in history. And he doesn't agree that you can draw that conclusion. The fact that something is happening doesn't mean anything one way or another about whether it's good or desirable or what we should want. And he says this from both directions in this passage. Prognosis does not imply anything about the desirability of the course of events that one predicts. If a doctor predicts that his patient will die presently, this does not mean that he desires it. One may hate socialism, or at least look upon it with cruel criticism, and yet foresee its advent. Many conservatives did and do. Nor need one accept this conclusion in order to qualify as a socialist. One may love socialism and ardently believe in its economic, cultural, and ethical superiority, but nevertheless believe at the same time that capitalist society does not harbor any tendency toward self-destruction. There are, in fact, socialists who believe that the capitalist order is gathering strength and is entrenching itself as time goes on, so that it is chimerical to hope for its breakdown. Okay. This is a more impactful statement than it may seem to us looking back on it now, because one of the dominant, what could be called standpoints of critique that movements are adopting in this period, particularly Marxist movements, but there are others, is the notion that history is leading in a particular direction. So it's, it's a mutation of this ideal of progress that we've talked about in past weeks. And that the direction in which history is moving tells us something about what is moral 
Okay, so we are going to criticize current society from the standpoint of what we think that society is developing into anyway. And that's going to provide, or is experienced as providing, greater moral weight to our argument. And Schumpeter is saying, this just doesn't follow. The fact that something is happening, that we are progressing or developing in a certain direction, doesn't have any implications one way or the other for whether that thing is right. You have to judge that based on other standards. Okay. And then he talks about a an argument about how capitalism is developing and why the belief arises that it's going to collapse or be succeeded by socialism. And this is quite hard to read this section because he's starting out, it's in the middle of the book, and he's really in the trenches fighting against particular forms of theory, and he's not taking great pains to summarize the forms of theory he has in mind. He is assuming that his readers will be familiar with the state of the discussion, and he summarized parts of it elsewhere in the book. So this section is trying to argue that capitalism tends to generate processes that will phase capitalism itself out, and it focuses particularly on the development of large enterprises and the concentration of production. He says that this is a shift, and this is a very common argument that's made in the period that he's writing, where capitalism of the 19th century is associated with individual proprietors who own their capitalist concerns and who employ less skilled manual laborers. And he's saying that that dynamic and the characteristic conflicts between the proprietors and the laborers becomes less and less important um, as you get the development of large-scale industries, you get joint stock companies where it's a little unclear who the owner actually is because ownership is distributed. Um, you get a whole variety of different people who are still proletarian in the sense that they're selling their labor, but they occupy various levels of education and skill, and so that's a different dynamic as well. And he, over the long course of the argument, concentrates particularly on the rise of an educated class, and he thinks that Marx is actually an example of this, um, that has certain incentives to become critical of capitalism as a whole, and a tendency for that to drive changes in what we're going to do in terms of innovating our economic institutions. So, in the midst of this argument, um, he's picking on people, particularly who are developing reports for government agencies, where the reports are emphasizing the anti-competitive nature of the capitalist economy now that you have these huge firms. There aren't very many of them. They've got huge economies of scale. They've already driven most of their competitors out of business. And so they look pretty monopolistic. And if you've got a monopoly, then you don't seem to have the kinds of competitive pressures that are meant to lead to better results for consumers in a traditional model of how capitalist society works. And he says, look, competition has actually never been perfect. Uh, you have to have some particular kind of utopia in mind if you think that's the case. It's not that it is newly become imperfect. It's never been. It's never been perfect. And he says that there is a perception that because we have these large-scale industries and because competition has subsided, that capitalism is no longer generating the gains that it was meant to generate. And he says, look, the statistics don't actually support that. And he draws attention to something that is also quite central to Marx. He says, you know, don't look at the, the amount of money that's involved in the goods. You've got inflation and other things that makes that a weird measure. Um, look at the amount of labor that's required to produce the items that are in the standard working person's budget. Okay, and if you think about indices we have today, things like the consumer price index or something like that, that have a basket of goods, and that basket of goods is something where you see how much it costs to get that basket of goods. He's doing a basket of goods analysis with reference to the items in a traditional, you know, sort of conception of what's in a working person's budget, and he says the amount of labor that someone has to perform in order to get the items in that bucket has fallen greatly over time, and it's fallen over this period that we think of as an anti-competitive period. So something seems to be working still about these large-scale industrial firms. They are still, in fact, reducing the costs in terms of the amount of labor that you need to expend, uh, and so standard of living is still going up 
He says, the shocking suspicion dawns on us when we look at this basket of goods and how much labor it takes to produce it, that big business may have had more to do with creating that standard of life than with keeping it down. Okay? And then he makes an argument that is actually very characteristic of something Marx would make. He says, what's wrong with the theories that predict that this wouldn't happen is that they are the victims of a fragmentary nature. So they're informed by observations and theories that he says are almost completely true. But they're fragmentary and they're misleading about the nature of capitalism as a whole. And this is a move that Marx makes over and over and over again in Capital, and Schumpeter's learned well from him. Uh, you take a theory and you show that it's looking at something that is perfectly true for that particular moment in time if you've looked at things in that particular way. And then you pan back to either a broader historical period or a broader spatial geography. And you realize that once you've panned back, what looked true at the micro level actually doesn't look so true or is not very characteristic of the larger scale. And that's the nature of the argument that Schumpeter is making here. Schumpeter says capitalism is an evolutionary process, and he specifically says he's got Marx in mind. He says, it's, you know, Marx has pointed this out. We should already know this. Capitalism is by nature a form or method of economic change, and not only never is, but never can be stationary. Okay? And he's saying this because he thinks most of the forms of economic analysis that he's surrounded by implicitly assume capitalism is stationary. They may know on some level that it isn't, but their analysis only makes sense if it is. Okay, and he says the dynamism of capitalism is due to capitalism itself. It is not due to some extrinsic natural or social change that causes it to be contingently dynamic. It's not due to the population increase. It's not due to the fluctuations of the monetary system. He says the fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion comes from the new consumer's goods, the new methods of production or transportation, the new markets, the new forms of industrial organization that capitalist enterprise creates. Okay. And then he points out something, and again, if you know anything about the consumer price index and how it's calculated today, he's pointing out a similar kind of problem, which is that if you think about what goes in a basket of goods for the consumer price index, and you want to see how prices change over time with reference to that basket of goods. The problem is that at different times, people are buying different things. Okay, so not too many people these days are buying cassette tapes. We have new forms of media. People are buying computers, but they wouldn't have done that several decades ago. So it's not just, he says, that the workers' budgets increase. Okay? It's that what they spend their money on qualitatively changes. And that qualitative change in what's in the workers' basket of goods is related to this dynamism of capitalism. So it's not just that it may tend to be more efficient at how it makes a particular thing. It's got this restless drive to make new things and to get people to consume new things and to find new markets and to displace old markets. And he says there's a history of revolutions of production and the development of new markets domestically and overseas. Okay, so it's a restless process, capitalism. Okay, and then he uses this term that he's famous for. Okay, he does a lot of different things over his career, but this is the thing that sort of, if you're a non-economist and you know Schumpeter for something, you know him for this. This concept of creative destruction. He says, the opening up of new markets, foreign or domestic, and the organizational development from the craft shop and factory to such concerns as U.S. Steel, which is a mammoth corporation at his time, illustrate the same process of industrial mutation, if I may use that biological term, that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one, this process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. It is what capitalism consists in and what every capitalist concern has got to live in. Okay, so a very strong claim. The way that it functions is in motion, and the nature of that motion is that new industries and new forms of production and new forms of consumption that are arising obliterate the old ones.
Okay, so there are whole industries we used to have that we don't anymore. There are whole ways of organizing production that we used to have that we don't anymore. It is a destructive process, and that, that destruction is precisely the way that it creates new things. And then again, he starts picking on his opponents, on other contemporary theories. He says, there's simply no point in examining capitalism at a static point in time. You have to view it as a dynamic process. And there's only a very small value in looking at only one small bit of the system. You need to analyze each bit of the system in relation to the dynamic of, a, of the whole. And again, this is something he takes pretty much straight from Marx. Okay, he's just doing something different with the argument. And so he says that the economists of his day who were analyzing anti-competitive practices and thinking that because competition's not working anymore because of the scale of industrial production, you need to bring in the state and you need to reorganize your economy. And once you've done that reorganization, it's pretty close to socialism anyway, so let's just make the economy socialist. He's saying that they're guilty of these errors. They're looking at the economy at a point in time and they're looking at only tiny bits of the system and they're not getting how it plugs into the whole. And when you do that, it makes these arguments in favor of socialism, he thinks, more plausible. Okay, and again, picking on existing theorists. The usual theorist paper and the usual government commission's report practically never try to see that behavior on the one hand as a result of a piece of past history and on the other hand as an attempt to deal with a situation that is sure to change presently as an attempt by those firms to keep on their feet on ground that is slipping away from under them. It's a great image. Okay? So this idea that existing firms, even if they're huge, are trying to sort of stay afloat, they're trying to keep their feet on constantly shifting terrain, and it's difficult to do. In other words, the problem that is usually being visualized is how capitalism administers existing structures, whereas the relevant problem is how it creates and destroys them. Okay, so it's looking at this point that you've got firms that are so huge and have done such a good job eliminating their competition that they have absolutely no threat. And so the only thing you can do if you want to keep them from completely abusing their consumers is bring the state in. And he's pointed out at the earlier stage in this argument that Look, that doesn't seem to be right, because we still seem to be getting more efficient about how we produce things. Why is that happening when, in fact, there's no competition in the conventional sense, or very little competition? Are we sure that we need the state to do these things? And he said, we're looking at competition too narrowly. Okay, there's a tendency to look at competition within a given set of productive conditions. And he says, but in capitalist reality, as distinguished from its textbook picture, it's not that kind of competition which counts. Okay, so it's not who your immediate opponents on the market that's the relevant issue. But the competition from the new commodity, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization. Okay, so it's not actually the competition with other companies going on around you right then. It's this fear that somebody else is going to come up with the next big thing, the next revolutionary technology, the next new product, and suddenly nobody's going to want what you're selling. Okay, and he says, that's the relevant kind of competition to pay attention to, and if that goes away, maybe you've got your case for bringing the state in. But he doesn't think you've got a strong case for bringing the state in if it's just that you're one of one or two or three or four or five big manufacturers in your particular industrial field. Competition which commands a decisive cost or quality advantage and which strikes not at the margins of the profits and outputs of existing firms, but at their very foundations and their very lives. This kind of competition is as much more effective than the other as a bombardment is in comparison with forcing a door. So he's saying even these huge concerns like U.S. Steel can be killed. They're vulnerable. They may not look it, they may look hugely powerful in markets that they dominate, dominate, but they're vulnerable to something coming along and we just don't need what they produce at all anymore, or something coming along that can produce what they produce in a radically new and unanticipated way. So it's so much more important that it becomes a matter of comparative indifference whether competition in the ordinary sense 
functions more or less promptly. The powerful lever that in the long run expands output and brings down prices is in any case made of other stuff. Okay, so he thinks we're pushing a huge regulatory apparatus in place based on the wrong idea, based on the wrong problem. Okay? And here he says something extremely interesting, and it's particularly interesting if you read the Foucault this week. He's writing decades before Foucault, uh, and yet pointing to something quite similar, but driven by different causes than Foucault does. It also has some relation to Weber, whom we talked about in the common lectures this week, uh, and Weber's notion of capitalism as an ascetic form of social life. Schumpeter says, it is hardly necessary to point out that competition of the kind we now have in mind acts not only when in being, okay, so not only when it's there and people can see it, but also when it is merely an ever-present threat. It disciplines before it attacks. Okay, this is very interesting to think in relation to the Foucault. Um, but so he's saying the abstract possibility that someone could right now be sitting on the technology that's going to revolutionize your industry or someone's going to come up with some whole new form of production that we haven't even thought of today, but that's going to render your product useless. Okay, Just the thought of that is enough to keep these large concerns competitive. Okay, They behave as though they're subject to immediate price pressures, even when they're not. He says, the businessman feels himself to be in a competitive situation even if he is alone in his field, or if, though not alone, he holds a position such that investigating government experts fail to see any effective competition between him and any other firms in the same or neighboring field, and in consequence conclude that his talk under examination about his competitive sorrows is all make-believe. In many cases, though not in all, this will be in the long run enforced behavior very similar to the perfectly competitive pattern. Okay, so Schumpeter finds sort of the world's tiniest violin to sympathize with the huge businessman who's claiming that he's still subject to competitive pressures. Schumpeter's saying, look, there's something in this. Okay, the, the person looks like they're really puffing it up. Uh, I don't know if any of you have followed the various fights in various countries over Microsoft, but Microsoft has actually been making arguments like this in a pretty direct way that the danger is not somebody else right now competing with Microsoft. The danger is what's around the corner, what's about to happen. And they've made precisely this sort of argument. It doesn't mean you have to buy it, uh, but this is the argument being made. So that's Schumpeter. It connects interestingly with Weber and Foucault. And we will run into Schumpeter again when we get to the economic section of the course.